The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. So if I get this straight, you're the David from the past. That's right. And you brought Jack with you into the tortoise that was originally your TARDIS but got fused both with the Audi and Jack himself. Proof positive that I'm certainly bound to get smarter as time goes by. But how is Jack supposed to rescue us? Aha! Aha! Yes, indeed. Aha! You see, Eureka would have been far too, um, on the nose. Atali, the eternal leader of the Vedic, Vidrex, will now speak. Thank you. My children are extremely orderly. Are they not, Mr. Alt? They don't look a thing like you. Except, of course, for that lovely glowing eye spout. Of course, that comes from Daddy, I'm sure. Humor! It is an archaic concept. But it is enough to power the video matrix of the RSS feeds. The pod voice is only one part of the great web of existence. And that existence is... Visual! So you said before. Ad nauseam, actually. Your audio voice is also archaic. It facilitates only audio stimulation. It forces beings to think. Nobody in the web wants to think. Images sent directly to their cerebral cortex. Simple stories. Shortened phrases. Sharing cat pictures. That's what people want, and all the time it continues to fuel the Videk. But there's bandwidth enough for everyone. Can't you leave the audioverse in peace? Peace! There can be no peace. The battle for attention has begun. We want to enable distractedness. That's why we've created the myth of multitasking. As long as everyone is constantly changing their focus, the machine will be fed. What machine? Even now, your David Alternate is setting the YouTube weapon for maximum voice. The YouTube will eat away at the audio voice until there is nothing left. I can't believe that any clone of ours could be so diabolical. And this explains why we've settled into the space around darker projects. Please come with me. You're listening to Audio Theater in a Darker Shade. This is DarkerProjects.com. And now our feature presentation. Previously on the new Night Terrors. Name? Most of his face was in shadows. All I could see, really, was his mouth, lit by the glow of the scanner screen. His mouth and a glitter of reflected light from the frames of his wire rim glasses. My sister lived in Santa Monica, but she kept an address in Riverside for just this reason, hoping my parents and I could use it to come visit or stay. Travel outside of this state is a privilege, not a right. Congress passed the Constitution Restoration Act, and states were finally free to restore Christianity to public life, and the Federal Communion of Christian Churches was founded and works really hard to protect us from abortionists and child kidnappers and pedophiles and homosexuals. When she visited, she'd bring back other books, special books. Books on discs or on chips or memory sticks, never on paper. Books that nobody could ever get here. Stories with homosexual heroes even. Historical figures, real people sometimes, like Alexander the Great, or Alan Turing, or Harvey Fierstein. Sometimes, pretty often, stories with homosexual boys. Boys like me. With a name like Jefferson Earl, I'd hardly think you were homosexual, especially considering your first name. I froze. I... I don't know what you mean. Oh god, it's over. We're lost. And now, the conclusion. Once you lived in a world of darkness. Once you lived in a world of fear. 
but now between the realms of the waking and the sleeping worlds, on you, Night Terrors. The new Night Terrors, an anthology of horror, suspense, and science fiction. Tonight's episode. Please, come with me. Now, son, it's not all that bad. You were given the middle names of two presidents. That's hardly something to be ashamed of. Particularly Mr. Carter's middle name. He was a sound member of his church, which was a very respectable church after all. And as for our Mr. Clinton, well, we are all sinners in the end. We acknowledge that. It was a game I could tell. He was enjoying himself. I was too, too, too scared to, to hate him. I'm, I'm not a homosexual, sir. My voice sounded strange, and strained even to me. I had a horrible thought that I might start crying, and I felt stinging around my eyes, and my mouth began to twist up. Blue-lit lenses, looking silently on me, unmoving. I had to drop my head. Son, as I just said, we are all sinners in the end. Before the eyes of the Almighty. All of us. Without exception. All of us, Jeff, are inclined to sin. All of us have tendencies which incline us to sin. To a greater or lesser degree. Some of us are just more challenged than others. Do you understand me, son? No, I... Maybe, son, that you are not indeed inclined to homosexual acts. You are, after all, at an age where friendships can be intense. Some of the best, most enduring, most intimate friendships in our lives take place at just about your age. And as long as you are aware of the possible pitfalls of letting those friendships become too close, too intimate, of letting those friendships lead you into illegal behavior, in other words, then such things can be harmless, even blessed. His words were coming out more and more like those of a preacher. The cadences, the rise and fall of his voice, and suddenly I knew. I knew that he was high-ranking in Holnam security, and why. And even if you are, son, inclined to homosexual acts, well, inclination by itself is not illegal. Not in our state. No, we feel it is far more appropriate that we try to gently correct such inclinations through proper activities. Prayer, a great deal of prayer, certainly, and the intervention of youth ministries and proper instruction. Why, we treat young people who are in danger of falling with the greatest care. We don't even address adult homosexual offenders with medical solutions until their third arrest and conviction. Your state cares about you, son. Sir? Youth Ministries was whispered about at school all the time. A boy in my class named Aiden had been sent to Youth Ministries for selling some sort of drugs to other students. Nobody could believe he would be so stupid, but... He was sent. He came back a year later. Changed. Damaged, I thought. Kind of weird. Like, in some important way, he wasn't really there anymore. His eyes were empty, and you couldn't really just talk to him, have a normal conversation. He just, like, not even not look at you. He, he sometimes said these strange things. I'm, I'm not a homosexual, sir. And Peter isn't a homosexual either, I promise! We're just friends, friends, sir. I fought to keep my face still. 
to keep from breaking down and crying. The gleam of blue from his lenses again in silence. I, I just, just tell me what to say, sir, please. Looking back, that's what did it. Saying please, asking him for something, breaking down. I'm sure that's what did it. He let the silence go on for a long time before saying anything. Now, son, I think I just got through telling you that your state cares about you. We have your interests at heart, Jeff. We are here to help. Later, I thought I remembered that even through my terror, even with my eyes stinging and my nose filling up, I thought I could hear something just a little different in his tone now. Satisfaction, I think. Just a hit of satisfaction. Maybe. If you tell me that you are not inclined to this particular sin, this particular variety of human weakness, well, I have no means at my disposal to prove you wrong. No objective, technical means. In the end, son, I have to accept your word on this. But keep in mind, Jeff, we are here to help you with such impulses. If you find yourself feeling susceptible, vulnerable, will you promise me, son, that you will keep us in mind? Yes, sir, I, I promise, sir. He shifted slightly behind his scanner, and a few seconds later, the guard came out the door with my clothes on a big, messy bundle. My clothes wound up on a table near the door. Uh, one more thing before we let you go on to your flight, son. Sir? On to my flight, my stomach lurched again. It was like getting slapped. The hope coming back was almost painful. We'll need to do a body cavity inspection. I know it's unpleasant, but under the circumstances, I'm afraid it's unavoidable. Now, if you'll just relax, it'll be over before you know it. The guard came up to me, and for the first time, I noticed he was wearing those purple hospital gloves. He took a flashlight out of his belt with one hand. Opened up. So I did, and tasted the latex and powder, and his fingers probed my mouth. I remembered another thing that my sister told me, the last and only thing I'd searched like that. After Aiden at school was arrested for drugs, they'd strip-searched us all, and I came home from school, furious, humiliated, scared, almost crying. It's not that they expected to find anything. It's just to show you that they can do that to you. It's just to show you that they can. Bend over the chair. The man at the workstation was back to reading his screens. And just to show you, they can. After, they let me clean up in a washroom behind another door, and when I came out, my backpack was on the table, and my ticket and ID and exit permit, and they let me get dressed. And all the time, the man at the workstation kept reading his screens, completely absorbed, not saying anything. One last thing, son. Sir? I'm afraid we are going to need that crucifix, the one around your neck, and the chain. We'll forward it on to you at your sister's address in Riverside, if we're done with it on time. Otherwise, we'll send it to your home. You have the receipt prepared? Yes, sir. And as I unfastened the chain and put it in the guard's hand and took the receipt chip, I couldn't look at either of them. And all I could think of was how badly I'd failed. How badly we all failed. Finding Peter at the gate, just finding him there, safe, and just looking into his eyes, I choked. The feelings were so intense, I just couldn't talk. 
with all the people, all around us, it was like some immensely private, personal thing, forcefully played out in public. And I so, so wanted to throw my arms around him. And I know he did too. You're all right. Are you all right? His face was white and strained, his eyes searching my face. And I saw his eyes go down to my open collar where the crucifix was missing and come back up to meet mine again, terrified, wide, helpless. Fine. I, I, I'm, I'm fine. You're okay? I guess they took it. He whispered, his eyes still wide, and I knew he meant his Bible, not my crucifix. I know. It, it's okay. I squeezed his shoulder again, once, wondering if it was true. Once again, all passengers for flight 4419, not stop service to Los Angeles. We are now boarding rows 475 to 555 through gate A, and rows 200 to 250 through gate B. Please have your boarding pass, identification, and exit permit out for the gate agent. They already called our seats a long time ago. We have to go. We hoisted our backpacks and moved across the dingy carpet to the boarding line of milling anonymous people trying to ignore the blue-shirted Homeland Security guards walking slowly, slowly up and down. And looking ahead, I saw him. The man behind the workstation, the one who questioned me. He was scanning the line, casually, talking to another blue-uniformed figure. And the weird thing was, even here, in the harsh overhead airport light, his glasses flared. They reflected, not like mirrors, just reflected, kind of like soap bubbles. Then he saw me. I could tell. Even though I couldn't see his eyes, he went still. And then he made a comment to the man next to him and began scanning the crowd. And I looked away and felt the terror. Again, like a moose in front of a rattlesnake, only worse, because the line was slowly, slowly creeping along to where the man with the glasses was standing. I told myself to keep calm, keep my expression calm, not to look at Peter, not to look at the man with the glasses. Shuffle step, shuffle step. Flight 4419 for Los Angeles, now boarding all passengers, all passengers for flight 4419. Please board at gate A for seats 1 through 250. Please board at gate B for seats 251 through 555. Once again, flight 4419 non-stop service to Los Angeles. Now boarding all passengers. Step, shuffle, shuffle. Bags with wheels bumping over ridges in the cheap carpet in front of us. Peter's feet in scuffed track shoes shuffling to my left. We were so close to the gate when it happened. Excuse me, sir. Please step over here. I look up. A Homeland security guard with his hand on Peter's shoulder. Peter's face, whiter now, even than before, looking at me. Then they were leaving the line, moving over towards the table, off to one side. Oh, God, no. I followed them. Not close enough to get shoot away. Close enough to watch. To be there. Please put your bag on the table, sir, and open it. The guard began slowly, slowly taking out everything from Peter's backpack. Looking at each item, lingeringly, carefully. As if it came from another planet. The bottle of water, the sweatshirt, the portable 3 VD player his parents had given him at Easter. Once again... All passengers for flight 4419, non-stop service to Los Angeles, should be boarding at this time. All passengers for flight 4419. More blue uniforms came up to the table where Peter was standing. One of them picked up the 3VD player, turned it over in his hands, peered at it closely. He was wearing purple hospital gloves, just like the guard who surged inside me. The first guard kept his hand on Peter's shoulder, not to comfort him. It was custody. UID and your exit permit, please, sir. I heard one of the new guards say, and I saw Peter's hands shaking as he handed them over. 
The three guards kept slowly, carefully looking over at the things on the table. Peter's bag. Taking their time. Making notes in, in their handhelds. Standing there, minute after minute, my left leg starting shaking from the tension. I try not to look over and up at the man with glasses. Just a few feet away from both of us now. I really tried not to, but I did. He was looking at me, directly at me, eyes invisible behind the glare of his lenses, not saying anything to the guard next to him. I moved closer to Peter. All passengers, this is the final boarding call for flight 4419. Non-stop service to Los Angeles. All passengers should be on board at this time. Once again, final boarding call for flight 4419. Non-stop service to Los Angeles. Over at the gates, a handful of passengers were clustered, talking urgently to the agents. The rest of the floor was empty. What is your final destination in California, sir? Riverside? I stepped up to Peter's side. Two of the guards slowly looked up at me, professional hearts in their faces. I felt the man with the glasses look at me from an angle. I swear I felt it. Excuse me, sir. Please step away. I actually approached someone from Homeland Security. I actually interrupted someone from Homeland Security. That's how far I'd come in three hours. Sorry, it's just that the plane is leaving and me and my friend... This may take a while, sir. I'd advise you to board. Go. Looking at me, his face drawn and white and tragic. His voice shaking so... Go on. It's okay. I'll get on the next flight. Once again, final boarding call for flight 4419. Non-stop service to Los Angeles. All passengers should be on board at this time. Doors will be closing in a few minutes. I looked over at the man with the glasses. He was still looking directly at me, listening to everything, every word. They were all looking at us now. All of the guards. Waiting. Please, just go. Jeff, it's okay. Just go. I'll be all right. Please. He tried a fake, reassuring smile, and it hurt to see me. And then his face was a map of terror and grief and tears about to come. But so much of the fear was for me, for me, because he loved me. We weren't going to let him go. We all knew it. Please, just go. And I felt my, my own horror, of course, and numbing grief that we'd come to this, that Peter had come to this because of me. But mostly surprisingly, I felt tired. So, so tired of being afraid all the time, of being afraid for Peter, being afraid for my parents. Tired of uniforms everywhere. Tired of watching myself all the time, every day. Tired of trying not to slip. Trying, tired of trying to fit in. Tired of trying not to touch Peter in front of everybody else. Tired of the whole world. This world. They wouldn't let us leave. I felt myself sinking into the warm weariness as they all looked at us, those people in the blue uniforms, watching every word. Final boarding call, flight 4419 for Los Angeles. Doors are closing. I'll wait. I didn't even try to think what my face was showing. We'll get the next flight together. Maybe they let us sit together in the van on the way to the youth ministries. It was a small, small hope, but it was all I had, and I held on to it. And weirdly, oddly, it was almost a relief. I felt calm, almost, for the first time in so, so long. The guard holding Peter's exit permit looked over at the man with the glasses. In the corner of my eye, I saw something, a flash from his lenses as he moved his hand. And I looked at him. The man with the glasses. He was looking right at me, still, of course. And even though I couldn't see his eyes, behind the lenses, I could feel them, locked onto mine, the way some carnivorous bug locks onto some squirming prey before pouncing on it. Before tearing it apart, devouring it, possessing it, and standing there next to Peter, exposed, defeated. I felt like he was already devouring me, devouring my soul. He held my gaze like that for two heartbeats, three heartbeats, and then he nodded to me, 
like we were the only two people in the room, the only two people in the whole airport. He nodded twice to me, and then leisurely, slowly, he turned back to the main guard and made a little motion with his hand. The guard stood still for a long, long second, blinking at the man with the glasses. Then he handed the exit pass back to Peter. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. You're free to go. The other two guards turned to gape at him. Peter, tears running down his face, just stood there and looked at him, stunned, lost, and saying nothing. I looked at him again, just for a second, as he looked at me, both of us still, his eyes unreadable. Then I pulled Peter's hand towards the gate. Peter turned back and, still crying, began stuffing everything back into his backpack. I watched as one of the gate doors closed. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Exit permits. I saw her look up over my shoulder to where the man with the glasses was standing, and her face changed. And she took our boarding passes, and without looking at us, she ran them through the machine and let us by to run down the ramp and through the hatch into the plane. It was the next day before we really talked to Rebecca. Really talked. They came to get us, my sister and her boyfriend Hugo, at the airport. But when I tried to tell her about my crucifix and Peter's Bible, they just hushed us both up, talked about my parents and Miss Frond and the neighbors instead. We went to some place where Hugo works, and we had to give up all our clothes and our bags and everything. But it was okay because Rebecca had new clothes for us, and they were strange but they fit in better with being in California. But first we had to take some special showers and get scanned by special machines, and they told us after that we had been pretty well infested with RFID surveillance chips in our hair, in our old clothes, on our skin. When we got off the plane, home security chips mostly, but it was still all right because everyone was so, so nice to us, sympathetic and warm, like real people, nice, open, concerned for us, friendly, so totally not like home, and so totally not like the airport back home. And finally, finally, next day after breakfast, we talked. It was Peter and me and Rebecca and Hugo and one other man we didn't know in the breakfast nook at Rebecca's and Hugo's. Oh, honey, I am so, so sorry you had to go through all of that. I am so sorry. She was so much older than I remembered. Somehow she sort of looked like a cross between the Rebecca I grew up with and my mom, but still so, so beautiful to me. And I loved her so much, and I was so glad to see her. And right now, her face was all serious, and there were tears in her eyes, and she held my hands across the table. The sunlight gleamed on our hands, on her engagement ring. Uh, I, I don't understand. You mean it wasn't real? What was in the crosses? The man who wasn't Hugo, who, who, he was older, but he dressed younger than I expected. He wasn't even wearing a tie, cleared his throat. <clears> throat. The data you carried was real. It is real. Fairly mundane, but useful. Payroll records? Valid payroll records, which we obtained, which clearly demonstrate that quite a few of the state homeland security officers were also being paid by the church, by federal communion security, completely predictable, of course, whenever a country or a, a piece of a country sets up secret security organizations. One of the first thing that happens is that those organizations try to infiltrate each other. And our information. It won't get anybody hurt, will it, sir? I didn't want to have anything to do with causing somebody else to be interrogated like I'd been, going through what we'd been through, or worse. The older man smiled. Not at all. Some people will be fired from their second jobs, or perhaps just watched a little more closely. But no, nobody will get hurt. We're still a long ways from having gulags and firing squads in this country. 
I remembered the man with the glasses, the way he looked at me. I remembered that power, that quiet menace. I wasn't so sure. They had to do it, honey. We had to give them something to find, or they wouldn't have let you go. They know who you are. They know about me and Mom and Dad, and they would have kept you there looking and looking for weeks and weeks, or longer. Mom and Dad? Long, drawn-in breath from my sister, and then she glanced up at Hugo, then back at me. Honey, do you know what Mom and Dad do? What their work really is, I mean? Um, sure. Mom's a hospital administrator, and Dad... Rebecca shook her head, smiling, sadly. That's what they do now. Do you know what they used to do a long time ago, before... Well, before you were born? No. Mom is, was, one of the most highly respected geneticists in the country, in the world, really. And Dad was a molecular biologist. I thought Dad just worked in a chemical company, and, and Mom... Hun, you know that you came along quite a while after me, of course. Yeah? Do you know why? Another pause as she looked up at Hugo. Of course, I'd, well, wondered why my parents had me so late, in their forties already. But I'd always secretly figured probably I was a kind of an accident. Uh... Jeff, honey. When Mom and Dad said that you had important, vital information to bring out to us, they weren't talking about your crosses. That information is you. Part of you. Part of who you are. I didn't say anything. I just looked. Peter reached over and took one of my hands, in front of them, in front of everybody, and that alone made me flush red. It was almost as shocking as it was what we were hearing. Almost. But not quite. Rebecca looked up at Hugo. He turned his dark, dark brown eyes on me. Jeff, Peter, there is a whole new, very well-funded, very fast-growing field in human genetics involving research into the underlying biology of gay orientations, primarily the genetic factors involved but also the endocrinological influences in pregnancy that can help lead to homosexual, gay, or lesbian tendencies later in life. For the right candidates. It was still odd hearing the word gay rather than homosexual. I wondered if I'd get used to it. The rest of me just listened. I had no idea where this was going. Most of that research for the last few decades is unpublished. Unpublished research. Unpublished, but quietly peer-reviewed, outside of the FCCC states, at any rate. It's unpublished for a very good reason. There are enormous ethical questions involved in working on pinpointing the biological mechanisms which contribute to a gay orientation. Primarily, there's a fear that, well, states like yours, could develop a capacity to test for sexual orientation, maybe in the womb, by amniocentesis. The older man spoke up again, after looking at Hugo. We're not so much afraid of an outbreak of mass terminations of gay and lesbian pregnancies, at least not in federal communion states. Abortion is a capital crime in most of those states, after all, but we, we are afraid for the children what will happen to them in the wrong parts of the country of the world will they face well experimental treatments intense behavioral therapy or will they just be segregated from the rest of the population somehow we were all quiet for a moment I tried to imagine what life would have been like at home if they'd known about Peter and me known for sure from birth. Peter squeezed my hand. They... they wanted me? And they wanted me to be homosexual? I mean, gay? Yes, honey. Mom and Dad really wanted to have another baby. They'd always promised me a younger brother or sister to play with as I was growing up, but, well, they couldn't very easily do that. 
But right about the time things changed at home, before you were born, well, Mom was a big part of the research in this field, at the university. I'll have to show you some, all of her publications. Oh, I'd like that. We'll do it. Anyway, she and Dad were already scheduled in for in vitro fertilization when, well, the state constitution got amended, and the clinic they were going to was shut down, and the state police and Homeland Security were everywhere, and everything was changing all at once, and oh, gosh, honey, it was such a scary time. I remember it so well. So they went into her lab instead. And her own staff helped. And she and they and your father applied some of her research. Under the circumstances, there was no opportunity for review by an ethics panel. Obviously. Hand squeezes from my sister and from Peter. Everybody looking at me for a second. Me just looking down at the table. They, they wanted me? And they wanted me to be homosexual? I mean, gay? They really did so, so want you. And for the rest? Your mother was doing research in the field for defensive reasons. Her strong ethical position was to prevent prenatal testing or genetic screening or any other discrimination against lesbians and gays, but she knew it was only a matter of time before such things became possible. So she became an important researcher in the field and one of the leading advocates for ethical restrictions on the misapplication of such research. But they didn't know for a fact you'd be gay. We're far from that sort of precision, but they knew there was a significant chance, a better than ever chance you would be. And that by proving the techniques and locking down very restrictive not-for-profit patents on them, she and your father and I could help prevent the kind of intrusive testing we're still afraid is coming. And even before she knew she was carrying you, your mother sent me all of her notes, all of her data, all of her accumulated work, and then she destroyed everything on her end. Physically destroyed it, scrubbed it all very thoroughly, burned her data chips in an incinerator, and her lab was shut down by the state inside of a week. Dr. Mowbray was Mom's dissertation advisor and then her collaborator. And friend. Much more importantly, her very close friend. So you see why we had to get you here, honey? Do you see? It was for your own sake. We couldn't just leave you there. It would be so horrible for you and for Peter. Inhumane. But if Homeland Security or the Federal Communion found out about you, if they used you or tried to do research on you... You are the key to your mother's work, to the restrictive patents, and so maybe to the lives and freedom and, and dignity of thousands and thousands of other gay people just like you. More silence now as they looked at, at me. I could feel their eyes on me. I, I figured out later that they were afraid, afraid of how I'd react, how af afraid I'd think of myself as some sort of science experiment, maybe rather than a teenage boy, afraid maybe that I'd somehow blame my parents, maybe blame all of them except for Peter, for me being gay. As, as if I'd ever do a thing like that. They were so wrong. I know my mom and dad. I mean, I know them where it matters. Maybe not their past, but I know they love me. But now I, I knew they wanted me. Went to so much trouble just to have me. And they loved me. They wanted me. Even if I was a homosexual. Gay, I mean. They wanted me. Like I was. And all of a sudden, I missed mom and dad so much. And I loved them so much. Just the image of both of them doing dishes together at the sink. Me next to them, drying and stacking the plates. I couldn't help it. The, the, the tears just came. 
Will we ever see them again? I asked my sister, looking at her, and I felt the tears running down my face. And then she was leaning over the table, hugging me to her, awkwardly. I hope so, honey. I really, really hope so. We won't stop trying. We've been two months in California now. Some days I think I'll never get used to it. The air so dry, the light so different, and the people, and the net shows, and the traffic, and it's all so different. Some days I have trouble remembering home. I try to remember our kitchen, my room at home, our school, and it's hard. The memories seem sort of unreal, and that bothers me. But we're not scared anymore. We've never been scared since, not once. Peter and I live with my sister now in Santa Monica. We have our own room, and we share a bed. And in spite of everything, in spite of all we went through, I admit, I didn't really know what to expect when we escaped to California. I mean, we were taught California is an atheist state, capital of abortion and sin, mostly atheist. A state without an established church, a place for lost souls. But I'm not an atheist. I haven't become an atheist. When I hold Peter's hand on the beach and see the love of his smile, or when I feel his bare skin warm against me at night, when I catch the smell of him, the scent of his breath on the pillows we share, when I wake up in the morning, I, I know there is a God, and he or she is, is merciful. Still, sometimes in bed at night, I wonder, even with Peter breathing softly in my arms, or me snuggling safe and warm and loved in his, I lie awake sometimes and think, why did he let us go? The man with the glasses, I mean. Could it be just lack of proof? Did even the man with the glasses needs some sort of physical proof, some tangible evidence before throwing Peter and me into youth ministries. And maybe, just maybe, we didn't quite give him enough proof to get sent away. Or, or maybe, could it be he knew in advance? The information we carried, those payroll records that implicated the federal communion people who infiltrated Homeland Security, was letting us go sort of a thank you for the favor. Or, and this was a wild thought, maybe what the man with the glasses did know about us, for sure. Maybe he knew everything and he was secretly on our side, to some extent, s somehow. Maybe he had a homosexual son or daughter of his own somewhere. I don't know still, to this day, but one other last thought is the most chilling of all. I think back to the questioning, the sick terror I felt, and I see his glasses reflecting the blue and white screen light in the gloom. Maybe he was deliberate. Maybe he let us go for a reason. Maybe, just maybe, he let us go, let me go, to sort of infect me to infect my brain with the image of him standing there, skewering me with his words, to infect me with the memory of his false sympathy, the memory of his power over me, and the memory of the freezing fear he made me feel. Maybe he let me go so that I'd keep that image of him, those memories of him alive the rest of my life, wondering, wondering, long after he died, Long after he passed away, remembering him and wondering why he let us go. Him alive in my mind, long after he was dead and buried. I wish I hadn't thought of that possibility. I really do. But I wish I knew. I really wish I knew.
Well, what do you think? Is this something that could happen? Should happen? Or has already happened but in the darkness of conspiracy and complicity? Only you can address this question. All I know is that for Jeff and Peter, a new life awaited them, and thanks, perhaps, to a government official, the truth may someday come out. For the new night terrors, I'm Harpinger. Sleep well. You have been listening to Please Come With Me, written by Douglas, adapted for audio by Mark Brzee, featured in the cast for Mark Brzee's The Man, Justin Lahr as Jeff Christensen and the narrator, MJ Cogburn as Rebecca, Bob Fieser as Peter and Hugo, and Jack Ward as Dr. Mulberry. All other roles were played by members of the cast. The story was written by Douglas, adapted for the new Night Terrors by Mark Brzee. Music and sound effects courtesy of soundeffects.co.uk. Post-production and series producer was Mark Brzee. The executive producer for Darker Projects is MJ Cogburn. The executive producer for Leap Audio is Mark Brzee. This has been a co-production of Leap Audio and darkerprojects.com. Thank you for listening. Oh my, what is it? I feel rather queer all of a sudden. David, David, you're getting all ghost-like. You're, you're fading away. This means two things. One, I'm afraid you're on your own, David. I'm being drawn back to the past. And two, an old friend is dropping by soon. Sonic Society Season 10 is written and produced by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music provided by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society through Creative Commons licensing. The Sonic Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. This has been an Electric Vicuna production.